It was just before 7.30 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, when Maura Murray was last seen. Her car was found damaged, locked, and abandoned on Route 112 just outside of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Her disappearance has haunted and frustrated family, friends, and a community of people searching for the truth. Since that night, there has never been a credible sighting. You're listening to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. How are you, Lance? I'm doing well. How are you, Tim? Doing pretty well tonight. We have Clint Harding back on. Investigative journalist Clint Harding for the majority of this episode. And I liked Clint the first time he came on because of his uh, down-to-earth, real kind of like real person attitude. So I'm looking forward to this one. I always picture him in in some, you know, small room in in like a basement or whatever with papers everywhere. And you can, you know, you can can picture it in your head. You can hear him shuffling him around and and he's looking for all this information that he's gathered over the years. So I'm really looking forward to what he has to bring to the table on this one. Clint is going to talk about the red truck. The Rusty Knife, the A-Frame House, Mora's time at West Point, and am I leaving anything out, Lance? Well, the party, right? The uh, the infamous party at uh, Sarah Alfieri's uh, dorm. So, That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll talk about that as well. So we have that coming up in just a moment, but before we roll that interview, Lance and I wanted to talk about meeting up with some of the listeners of the Missing Mora Murray podcast in November. And that idea actually was brought up to us by one of our listeners who follows us on Twitter. Do you have the name uh, of, the, of that person? Caitlin Rose tweeted it to us. We're asking you to give us a tweet or an email if you would be interested in showing up to this um, this meetup in East Boston on November 7th, a Saturday afternoon. We'll try to get a, a gauge of how many people are going to be there. So maybe about a week and a half out from the date, we will book the location and we'll let everybody know. So, you know, make sure to contact us uh, before that. And, um, you know, we'll get a sense of how many people are going to be there. Uh, We'll bring some refreshments, some food, and uh, it'll be like an open forum. And, of course, we will record it and uh, and we'll we'll play it. you know, a few weeks after that. Yeah, maybe we'll do some interviews for the documentary and uh, we'll get to meet some of the listeners, hear their ideas, um, their theories on the case and just, uh, you know, get to know some of the listeners. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, and just to actually see this community face-to-face uh, here at Open Forum and, uh, you know, just a good discussion about it because that's pretty much what we're doing right now. The whole thing is a, is a marathon, you know. We got to go through every detail. We got to almost talk the thing out. We got to talk every little detail out and to uh, get people right there with us in the same room. Room. I think it's going to be great. Email us if you are interested in coming to join us. Uh, the email address is missingmoramurray at gmail.com. And you could also tweet us. Um, we are at doc D-O-C, on Twitter. We're also on Facebook. You can just type in Maura Murray or the disappearance of Maura Murray. And we are now on Instagram. And that handle is at missingmoramurray. Also wanted to remind everyone to call the hotline that we have set up for this case. We have gotten some amazing voicemails lately, um, and since we asked for more last week, we definitely we definitely got more in from the uh, than the week before. So that was pretty awesome. But keep them coming. We want more. Please call one eight seven two two five Mora. 1-872-25 Mora, and that number works out to. 872-256-2872. We really want to hear your voice, and don't you want to hear your own voice on this podcast? Also wanted to encourage everyone to check out the articles written about the show lately. We had a great review from Andrea Ruth on CheapSeatsView.com. Also, Aurelia is blogging her blog. She wrote another fantastic entry about this show, and the article from Chris Peak on medium.com. We'd uh, love everyone to retweet that if possible. Just want to get as many eyes and ears on this case and podcast as we can. All right. So without further ado, I think it's about time to roll the Clint interview and Tim and myself will be back at the end of it. Thank you. 
Welcome to the show, Investigator Clint Harding. Thanks for having me back, guys. Appreciate it. No, it was uh, it was a pleasure to have you on the first time, and uh, yeah, we're happy to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We got some great reaction uh, from your first appearance, and uh, so we wanted to have you back and finish our conversation, or maybe not even, uh, or at least get to more of the topics that uh, that we had talked about off air. I felt yeah. like we uh, talked about a lot of things, but then at the end of it, I was like, well, man, there's so much that I, I uh, did, we didn't get to, really. So part of that was probably I just wasn't very organized. So hopefully I'm a little more organized this time. I don't know. I still have papers all over my floor right now, so it could be interesting, but we'll, we'll <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> Sounds good. Many people don't realize that the family, through their spokespeople, have actually gone into pretty good detail about why Mara left West Point. I don't think that known at all it doesn't seem like you know it seems like the family has been mum on some of this these kinds of issues but but when it comes to west point the family uh, through their spokespeople have actually gone on record about this so i just wanted to at least you know provide somewhat of that version so we have something else to work off of from west point because you know she, it does sound like she she uh, was involved with that theft of makeup, and, and it sounds like, you know, that could be something that led to her leaving West Point. But, but through uh, another version, uh, you know, I kind of think it could be both. I think she could have, uh, you know, been busted for that, but I also think she could have left on her own terms at West Point. So I just wanted to, to go over some, some things I found out about West Point. Uh, I could tell you for a fact – that this theft of makeup took place in July of uh, 2001. And Mara actually attended uh, West Point for the, the entire semester after, the, after this theft took place. So if she had uh, been punished, I, I don't know how long punishment would take for something like that to, uh, you know, to actually put in place, but she uh, still intended a, attended a, a full semester after the theft at West Point. Oh, no kidding, because it's out there in a way where uh, it seems like she gets busted for it and then she's gone. Right, right. And so I definitely wanted to make that clear. I also wanted to make clear Mara was a, a freshman getting ready to be a sophomore. And when you're in your first two years at West Point, life is very tough for you. Uh, one of the things they do is they, they literally break you down mentally. And that's, that is by design. They want to break you down mentally. And your final two years, they build you back up. And when you're a junior and a senior, which uh, Mara's sister, Julie, and Billy were both juniors at the time Mara enrolled at West Point, which means that uh, they could have possibly been uh, people that uh, gave Mara grief all the time. That was the job of juniors and seniors. They went around and messed with the freshmen and sophomore and and made their life's hell basically and that was what that's all by design so when you hear a perspective that mara's sister was tough on her you know of course she was i mean that she's a junior and mara's a freshman and and juniors look down at freshmen at, at west point it's you know it's not intentional i mean obviously there's a purpose behind it it's not they're not doing it just to be mean but that, that's the role. Uh, uh, when you're a freshman or a sophomore, you uh, have to stand at attention when you encounter a junior or a senior. They can tell you to, they can boss you around, basically. They can make your life hell. And when it comes to punishments of a freshman and sophomore, they usually are internal, uh, they're dealt with internally, dealt with by the juniors and seniors. So when it comes to this theft, uh, she probably had to stand in front of a panel but the panel was probably juniors and seniors, uh, fellow cadets that probably uh, dealt her punishment for whatever whatever they decided. And from what I what I do have read it, that uh, getting you know getting kicked out is, is is hard to do if you're a freshman and sophomore. Not so much when you're a junior and senior. Not only then are you committed to the army by that point, but you're in a leadership position at that point. So if you were to commit theft as a junior or senior. I would say you'd have a much better chance of getting kicked out of the school. You said earlier that your freshman and sophomore year at West Point, they work on breaking you down. Right. 
and then the junior and senior year, they work on uh, rebuilding you, building you back up. You get um, leadership responsibility. You start getting leadership responsibilities as a sophomore, but I, but mostly it's when you're a junior and senior that you're you're in full leadership mode. You're built back up. And now it's your turn to kind of take out your frustrations on the uh, for incoming freshmen and the soft and the sophomores. So how would that leave somebody when they leave that school? How would that leave somebody mentally when they've just been broken down and they haven't been built back up? Well, that's a good question. Uh, that one, I mean, this is something all military branches do a form of this. Uh, you oh know, sure, and it, yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to make this sound super nasty. I mean, I'm sure there. It's not all horror horror stories when you're a freshman and sophomore. I know they do a lot of team building uh, exercises. Those are probably designed to keep the freshman and sophomore from 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 bolting. And as a freshman and sophomore, by the way, you can leave. Uh, you can leave West Point, even though you've kind of signed up and and there's a five year military commitment once you go to West Point because they pay for your tuition. Uh, if you're a freshman and sophomore and you just decide that it's not for you, there is a process to get out. But it is not an easy process in the sense that you don't just say, you know, I want out, and then that night you're packing your bags and leaving. You have to stay continuing to do, you know, everything that a freshman and sophomore is required to do, and you're, you kind of get this label of somebody that's quitting, you know, and, and I imagine that would be a very rough, rough uh, go. To have to to go, to spend your final days knowing knowing you're leaving, and you kind of got this label that you know being a quitter and everything. So and you kind of leave like I get the sense that you'd leave without a without a, without an identity at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it you know, and I'm sure people handle that kind of thing you know differently. Some people do better with that kind of stuff, and and like, again, like I said, I, I maybe have overplayed the, that point that they do break you down. All, you know, I had to go through that in the Air Force. Mine wasn't nearly as long. Mine was just in my basic training. They do that, uh, and you know, it, it sounds horrible, but uh, it actually is something that the, they're really good at, and and they can, you know, they they read cadets very well. They understand maybe you know when to back off that kind of thing. So, and, and the juniors and seniors, they don't, they don't wish ill harm on their freshmen and sophomore. Uh, they're there for them. You know, they're there for the freshmen and sophomore too, it, just as much as they are, you know, giving them, giving them crap. Right. <clears throat> because so, it was anyway, done, it was done for them. Like, or it was done to them right. when they were yeah, going through They know through exactly it, so. what, what the freshmen are going through. They know yeah. exactly what the sophomores are going through. Uh, one of the punishments I know that they did, was very popular to hand out when somebody got in trouble was to make them uh, march around with a plastic gun. They called it guard duty, but they, I mean the, the punishments were pretty creative, uh, but they were mostly internal, especially with the freshman and sophomore. Now, according to the family sources, and this this family sp- source in particular is not a blood relative of the Murrays, but she had uh, full access to. Fred Murray and and Sharon Roush and all these all the people, and uh, according to uh, this source, Mara decided at the very end of her first semester of school, which would have been she started in August of 2000 as a freshman uh, student, and it was at the end of that semester that she decided she did not want to be in at West Point anymore. So that's a full, almost a full year before the, the stealing incident took place. And if, you know, if, if you're to believe the family version of that. So then maybe she was trying to steal something to move the process along? You know, that's you know, something you could speculate on. I will, I will say that uh, in, in, at Fort Knox in July of, of 2001, when this theft incident took place, that was also around the same time Mara failed to meet the deadline to get into UMass. She had picked UMass. Her father went to UMass, by the way. I don't know if many people know that. Uh, nope. So she she picked UMass to go to. She wanted to go there, and, and she, she her conditions on, on leaving West Point, though, she had to secure a uh, full scholarship ride somewhere. She had to also be close to her boyfriend, Billy. That was some of her conditions for for uh, making the final move to get out of West Point. And so she f- she was pursuing UMass, but she missed the deadline to uh, to get into UMass, uh, which would have been in uh, August of 2001. So she was stuck 
uh, staying at West Point for another semester. And again, that theft took place right before that. It took place at the end of the summer in 2001. Oh, that's interesting. And she she had a condition that where she was going to go, she would be close to, to Billy? Right. That was one. Oh. That was her condition. She had to uh, secure a full scholarship ride somewhere set in stone, and she wanted to be close to West Point. She went to UMass in the spring of 2002 as a chemical engineer major, which she switched over to nursing in the fall of 2002. And she actually showed up to UMass in, in, uh, like a month before classes began because she was on the track team and they were already in their practicing practices and stuff. Uh, another thing to point out is if, you know, if you're busted for theft, I know when it comes to athletic scholarships, uh, the character is a huge thing. It really is. Even if you have all the athletic talent in the world, uh, when people are looking to hand out scholarships, they are looking at, you know, what kind of character you have. So she, I mean, she was able to score, uh, a full scholarship to UMass. So, so I don't know that she was, uh, kicked out officially of West Point. This is maybe something that just took a long time for her to actually finalize and, and just kind of, but you know, who knows? And really we can't get into her head to know what the theft was all about, but I just wanted to provide that extra information just for another perspective on, on West Point. Thanks a lot. We yeah. appreciate that. Didn't know the extent of uh, like that time frame between when she uh actually stole the, the the makeup and when she left West Point. So good clarification on that. The Saturday dorm party and, and you know and and the fact that uh, we seem to hear very little from Kate and Sarah, those are uh, two of Mars' friends, is uh, troubling to a lot of people. You know, what are they, why are they not talking, why are they not sharing more information about the party, etc. Okay, and I would kind of provide a counter to that from, from what is known. And, and I, you know, for one thing, these two girls both were talking to the media within days of Mara going missing. So that is kind of conflicting, you know, the, the whole idea that they, they were mum about everything. Both of these girls were talking to the media within, I'd say, 10 days of Mara going missing. Uh, now, they haven't said a lot about this thing, and that's true, but they, have, they were cooperating. They were talking to the media, actually, and they were talking to police as well. Uh, one thing that uh, needs to be pointed out is every instance I've heard of this party, it's been referred to as a very small get together with, between a couple of friends, not as a large party at all. And, uh, another thing to point out, this is really important. Uh, the person that was supposedly hosting this party, Sarah Alfieri, uh, she was, uh, described as being passed out at the time, uh, Mara left the party. And as a matter of fact, Sarah had been passed out for several hours. So as far as her being able to provide information on, you know, what Mara was saying or Mar what Mara did after the, the party, it only makes sense that she wouldn't be able to help a whole lot because she had already been passed out for several hours. Who said that she was passed out? Kate actually said that she was passed out in one of the stories. And then let's get to Kate because, again, uh, we have to really understand this, this, this setup here. This is Sarah Alfieri's party. Sarah Alfieri was a friend of Mars through work. They worked at an uh, art gallery on campus together. Uh, Kate was Mars friend through athletics. And, you know, and I'm not trying to say, you know, if you're in athletics, you don't hang around other people and you only – but but athletes do tend to stick together and, and you know Mara at that point had not been on in athletics for like a year or so but she was still friends with Kate. The point I'm trying to get as get at is I you know I find it very realistic that Kate probably didn't know anybody at this party other than Mara. She seemed she might have just been a tag along to this to this little get together that night. So as far as her coming on and saying you know she doesn't know who was at this party or doesn't remember. You know, to me, that's an acceptable answer. I don't really find a whole lot of mis mystery there. Might as well go into this, too. Uh, I, I had sent you guys an article that was done by a Mr. Joe McGee. Uh, he, he's, the one, he's one of the ones that interviewed Kate and Sarah. Uh, we learned a little bit about Mara from Sarah in that article. 
And the reason I bring this particular article up is because it's not readily available online. And, uh, you know, uh, there's maybe there's reasons for why this article's not online. I know there was a, a comment made in that article about Mara and about how when she drinks that she maybe loosens up a little bit. And, I, you know, I don't know if that caused some, some issues with family. But I do know that when it came to finding this article, it was really hard to do, and not a lot of people have seen this article. But this article does specifically talk to both Kate and Sarah, and so I think it's important that, that it gets mentioned, and I do have the article in front of me. The article's really about how mysterious Mara was, just as a, fr as a friend, because Kate kind of starts out the article. She says she considers herself one of Mara's closest friends, and yet knows she has a mysterious side. I really don't know everything about her, so now I don't find it so hard to believe uh, when talking about Mara's disappearance. Uh, she is struggling these days to figure out why Mar Murray packed up her dorm room uh, a month ago and took off for New Hampshire. Uh, another quote from Kate is that she took that Mara took care of stuff on her own, and that's Mara. Uh, and if you got you guys have watched the disappeared episode, correct? Definitely. We've heard about Mara's close group of friends uh from hansen i think there was uh was there there's like five or six or seven girls that mara hung around with all the time she just i mean they're described as the you know really good friends of hers one of those friends that i would believe was featured on that disappeared show uh, her name was katie jones uh she she was attending a college really close to where mara was she was at western new england college in springfield Mass massachusetts and they only lived a few mile, miles apart, but they uh, they never visited each other at school. So I always found that kind of odd. She And Katie Jones describes Mara as a very secretive person. She never even told us about transferring to UMass until after it happened. Sometimes we think there might be more to that story than we know. That's what she's quoted as saying in this article. This is all in the same article. Okay, sophomore Sarah Alfieri is just as puzzled. She and Murray met while working at art galleries on campus, drawn to each other because of their sarcastic attitudes and love of things ironic. Uh, Sarah describes Mara as keeping her biggest problems to herself. She was so funny. She loved the website The Onion. Her favorite movie was Bottle Rocket. This is uh, Sarah talking now. Uh, now, one thing Sarah points out is that you know, Mara had that wreck with her father's car shortly after leaving Sarah's dorm room that night. Uh, the very next day after Fred had left, Mara had to go to work at the art gallery with Sarah, and Mara did not mention the wreck at all to Sarah. And Sarah only found out about the wreck once Mara went missing and everything came out uh, in, the, in the media. And so she, you know, she's kind of... Uh, she said she thought that was so weird. I talked to her that day, and she didn't say anything. And the story ends with, uh, with the author saying, now everybody is wondering about what they don't know about Mara Murray. If she can't figure it out after three years of friendship, Kate said nobody might ever know. To talk about the, uh, about the party, uh, at about 1 a.m., I'll Fieri said she was, pa okay, so Sarah did, is the one who said that she was passed out from drinking. So at 1 a.m., Sarah was already passed out from drinking. Kate was still up with Mara, and they were talking about going home at 2.30 in the morning. But Mara wanted to go to her father's hotel, according to Kate. I told her just to go back to her room and meet him in the morning, but she wouldn't listen. About an hour later, Mara cracked up her father's Toyota Corolla on Route 9. Alfieri found out the next week from news reports about her friend's disappearance. And that's pretty much all I got on there. There, uh, again, there was a, uh, uh, it wasn't an, a direct, it wasn't an actual quote. It was kind of like a implied that when Mara drinks that, uh, she tends to loosen up a little bit. Don't we all? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, I mean, but to me, this article is hard to find, and you have to wonder why that is. Right. Why do you think that is? I, I think uh, that they, the, this author, I, well, I don't know. I don't know, because you know, it could just be the newspaper. The newspaper, maybe they just don't have a very good archives uh, uh, way of getting their articles, you know, out online. You know, some newspapers are like that. You know, so it could just be as simple as that. But the reason why I even brought all that up is what, oh, uh, was because I had heard online 
a long time ago that there was a set of articles done by a specific person that really irked the family off and and basically you know and, and that's not substantiated truth or anything but that was something that was that's how i came across this article because heck i wanted to find out what these articles were and so you know i noticed that that uh, this particular article I, I i think i ended up having to pay for it actually because it was not something I could find. And, I, boy, I tried to find anything that, that would be any kind of controversy or anything. So uh, here is the exact mention in, in the article here. Uh, it, was, it actually just describes her as somewhat flirtatious. Yeah, I just read that. You know what else is weird about this article? It says uh, the paragraph uh, on the afternoon of February 9th, uh, Maury uh, – acted like she wanted to drop everything she worked hard for in life, packed up her belongings, um, left a message with professors and bosses lying about a death in the family. Then she loaded her Saturn sedan, a car that friends said she hadn't started in weeks, and took off. Yes, I see exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, that, that, was, an, that was definitely a narrative that was going around, that Mars' car was not in good shape and that, that uh, you know, but then how did she get to New Hampshire in it? You know, that's something yeah, that's kind of baffling. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. And also... Then she loaded her her Saturn sedan. I didn't think that there was anything in the car other than... Um, I mean, what did she load it with? <laughs> this makes me think that she packed up everything and was, like, pushing stuff in and, you know, couldn't shut the doors. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Because <laughs> obviously she left most of her stuff in her dorm, so... And uh, one other thing, this this guy not only uh, did this article, but he also did an article solely with Mara's mother. And a lot of people, you know, have wondered why we haven't heard anything from Mara's mom. But uh, he did a he did an article completely about her. So uh, you know, and again, these are articles you just don't find very easily. So that's why probably a lot of people think, oh, the mother doesn't seem to even care that her daughter <laughs> went missing, but. You know, in this in the article with the mother, uh, the mother did talk about trying to get out to uh, to to the accident location. She was trying to arrange for some coworkers at her. Uh, I think she worked at a nursing home to drive her out to the accident location. And I, you know, it's never said you know if she ever did make it or not. Obviously, we have a missing person, and the police, um, you know, a lot of what they did seems to be behind the scenes. They weren't, you know, going public with everything. So you have some instances where the family kind of were stepping in and doing their own investigating and coming up with things and turning them over to the police. So, you know, uh, you can kind of look at that. You know, the police have kind of always said they don't ever think there's been evidence of foul play involved so you can kind of look at that maybe that's the police were kind of it seemed like they were kind of in a mode where they were just kind of taking phone tips and then following those up but really weren't doing a a huge uh investigation you know that's just how it appears you know obviously who knows what's going on behind the scenes there so family uh did some some of their own investigating and in late 2004 uh it kind of starts with with uh, Kathleen, which is Mara's older sister. She uh, found a a pair of women's uh, underwear. Uh, I think it was on French Pond Road, and and excuse me, because I'm not super familiar with that area around the accident, but uh, so so maybe somebody else can give a little more explanation about the the area. But anyway, she found a pair of of women's uh, underwear, and that did get turned into police, and that did later uh, come back not having anything to do with Mara. So that's kind of where that started. Uh, and, then, and also in late 2004, uh, a, a, uh, I think he was a Haver, Haverhill uh, resident, turned in a knife to Fred Murray. It was a uh, stained, rusty jackknife that this guy turned in, and he, he claims that his brother uh, killed Mara Murray. And so he turns this knife into Fred, 
And Fred actually takes this knife to a police department. I believe it's in Concord, New Hampshire, that Fred took this knife to. He walks it into the police department. I have no idea what exact kind of department this was because uh, it's described that he dealt with a dispatcher so uh, who was working behind a, a glass. So Fred takes his knife in there, and they won't accept the knife in, in this, in this uh, police building. Uh, they, they said that they're not authorized to accept evidence of a crime there. So Fred actually takes the knife back with him back home, and he mails, puts it in the U.S. mail and, and sends it to the police. And really, who knows what the heck happened after that. Uh, basically... I think there have been reports where the police have come back and said that knife has nothing to do with this case. I know Fred has been quoted in an article in later years saying that that got debunked. And then then after that... What got debunked? Everything. The knife. Uh, the, the, and, the, and I was going to lead into they did a, a search of an A-frame house in 2006 that is related to this knife, but I haven't got to that point yet. But that whole thing, the, the A-frame house, the bloodstained knife, and the women's underwear were all things that Fred, in an article, was quoted as saying were debunked. But uh, family sources after that you know, kind of came in and said, no, 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 Fred never said that. He was misquoted and, and, and that kind of thing. So, so basically, you know, you know, who do we believe on that, I guess? Is, is... Yeah, because we have, we have two very large portions of this puzzle that have been uh, kind of active online without any real answers. One of them was the uh, – so I just want to visit these, uh, these, these two points you brought up. The, the underwear that was found, that was during a search party, correct? No. Well, oh. no, this was, uh, this was still in February of 2004. And this was Kathleen Murray. Uh, she found it lying in the snow near French Pond Road in Haverhill. And so this, this was still, I believe, when the family was still out there initially uh, doing their searches and that she came across this. So it was like an independent search that the family was yes, doing. That, and she that found was, it. she yeah. found it in the woods. Yeah, and I just brought that up just because it, it ties into the other things that the family, it's, it's all family-led. It's not police-led, the, these items. And right. so... So that's she did turn that. They did get that turned in successfully, and it did come back tested, and it had nothing to do with Mara. How do they know that, or how do we know that? Could have been like DNA tests. I guess that's what I was getting at. I was curious if we could confirm that it was DNA because I just never heard that they had picked it up. Uh, she did turn it into Haverhill Police, who said it would take about two weeks before the DNA results would come back. Great. Okay. This knife that Fred was given, um, this is uh, the, the Moulton brothers, correct? Lawrence James Moulton was the brother that turned in the knife, and he is no longer alive. Uh, and the brother was was Claude Moulton. And Claude Moulton uh, actually lived at one time in this A-frame house that was on uh, Valley Road, which is not far from the accident scene. And that kind of catapults us into 2006. So now we're going two years after the knife was turned over to Fred. Okay, so just to just to interrupt real quick, and I'm sorry, but yeah. this this um, Molten brother approaches Fred and says, right. "Like, how, how does he find him? He's just like watching him." You know, I don't know because it really the story kind of picks up with Fred receiving the knife. It doesn't really get into you know how how that. Uh, how that came about. I think this was from the Mary Beth Conway articles that were done. That, oh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. And then in another article by the Caledonian Record, Murray, it talks about Murray driving to the state police headquarters in Concord to turn it over to state police, but he said they refused to accept it. So he mailed the potential evidence to them and said he has not received any response or acknowledgement. Where did he mail it to? I would assume to Concord, the state police headquarters. Oh, okay, okay. So he, he went to like a, um, like a dispatch place in Concord. Yeah. Okay. And Mary Beth did go more into that. She said that he tried to turn the knife over to police, but did not get beyond the plate glass window at state police headquarters. I have what could be evidence. This is Fred talking. I have what could be evidence in a capital crime. He recalled saying to the dispatcher, but the dispatcher said no one was available at headquarters to accept such evidence. Fred was told to come back during regular work hours. Fred then mailed the knife to state police along with all the information received on the suspect. 
few days later, uh, Fred received proof of receipt that his package had reached the police, but he was never contacted by police regarding the knife or the possible suspect. So we go to 2006, and this is a family-led investigation. This has nothing to do with the police. Uh, that they, but I'll, I will say this, the family, they went all out. They got some good quality investigators to come down to the accident location, not just quality investigators, but really good, uh, search dog teams, which is probably something that had been lacking in, in the investigation to that point. So they brought in dogs from, uh, and I got that written, written down as well. Let's see. They brought in dogs from the Connecticut canine search in Dukes County search and rescue from Martha's Vineyard, uh, let's see, along with a team of private investigators that were hired by the family. The problem I have with this, with this weekend in October that they did this, this search was that they kind of announced this to the media ahead of time. And, you know, I don't know, to me, it just, it just smells a little funny that, that you're going to have a search that you invite the media to. Uh, you know, it's almost like, of course, you're going to come up with some things when you do that. I mean, it would be very disappointing if absolutely nothing came of that search that weekend. Why would they invite the media? Uh, uh, actually, they did almost like in sports. When I wrote, we used to write stories, we would do previews of games. There was like preview stories of this investigation getting ready to take place. Now, I will say... Uh, part of that might have been to try to to uh, get some uh, enlisted volunteers to come out and help. So that might be why they ran some some uh, stories ahead of time of the investigation. Okay, yeah, or maybe because uh, I I know that Fred uh, one of the things that he would do would be to go to the local um, restaurants or or uh, like pubs and would uh, try to hear if anybody around him was talking about Mora. And maybe uh, maybe announcing it to the press could have been some way to uh, shake somebody loose to maybe um, make somebody crawl out from under, you know? Right, right. Could have been a and technique. Like, what do they have to lose at that point? Now, I will say this also, that uh, the search consisted of a five-mile radius around the accident location, but they were not allowed to go on any private property. So the search had to be on public property, uh, the one exception was the A-frame house, and this was Fred that made sure that they investigated this A-frame house because this is where one of the Mo Moulton brothers, the one that supposedly killed Mara, this is where he lived at one time with his girlfriend, this the A-frame house. So Fred made sh and how he was able to gain access to this house was because it was vacant at the time, and he got with the realtor. And they and they approved him to be able to go in and bring in his his dogs and his search his uh, investigators into this house. And the house is on Valley Road, right? Valley Road. And uh, I did visit it. I took some pictures of the house. It's it's completely when when I was there, it was completely run over by grass. Uh, hadn't been mowed in years. It's not far from the accident. Yeah, location. I just wanted to point that out. It's about it's less than a mile. Um, yes. In a straight line, and then it's also less than another mile to French Pond Road and a small body of water, French Pond. Right. Okay, so the dogs go in this house, and they are described as going bonkers. And I guess these were the kind of dogs that can kind of scent, I don't know if it's necessarily blood that they scent, but they can kind of scent uh, flesh of some kind. Uh, they went bonkers in this house, allegedly. Uh, the investigators cut up two different samples of carpet from, from this house at where the, where the dogs were going bonkers at, and and those carpet samples got sent to two different places and nobody knows what happened to them. So, and he, even Fred has made a comment like, you know, he wishes, wishes that stuff would have made it to some proper authorities. But, uh, so when they searched the house, Claude's brother Lawrence, was he alive at the time? When did he die? Ugh. Yeah. I, uh, actually had his obituary and I, I don't know where it's at right now. He, I know when he at the time he turned in the knife, it was it was like a year after that. I would almost say, since he turned it in in 2004, that he was already dead by that point that they did this. I think he might have died in 2005, as a matter of fact, but I can't find his obituary right now. What did he die of? Uh, cancer, I believe. Okay. So when they searched the house, uh, it was vacant. Where was Claude at the time? I have no clue. I have no clue where he was living or what was going on with Claude at the time. Interesting. And he's still I do out. Know, 
Yeah, and I do know uh, he worked for a company that crushes cars, basically. Uh, there's a little conflict in information on which exact company he worked for, but it's in that area. So, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know if, what he's up to nowadays. So, but th this was something I really didn't, uh, you know, I would definitely wanted to learn about, but I didn't really ever take overly too serious because, you know, the police doesn't seem like they took it too serious. So. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to get at, because it seems like the family just doesn't trust the New Hampshire State Police. Yeah, there's definitely definitely issues there, and, and uh, you know, so it almost sounds like that they were kind of trying to take matters in their own hands at that point. They'd kind of given up on police. Do you think we should feel the same way? About the police? Yeah. Mm, no, no, I don't think, I don't think so. Uh, you know, again... It's really hard to really say what all they've done because a lot of what they do, they, they're they not going to say. So, you know, for us, it would really, really be hard to kind of judge something like that. Yeah. I think there there's some legitimate gripes that the family has. Uh, yeah. you, know, you know, it was kind of a typical accident uh, where maybe somebody was fleeing the scene to, to get away from a, a DUI, and that's not a huge, huge uh, deal. But then when you find out it's a young uh, young female, you know, I think that who's, who's lost in the middle of the woods, you know, it, it feels like maybe more should have been done that night, but at the same time, you know, they don't know the circumstances and they don't know Mara Murray. I mean, she could have had, uh, she could have been real close to a friend's house that night, you know, so they don't know what happened. They just figure as long as they got the VIN number on the car and they know they can track it to the owner that they'll be able to get this resolved probably in the next day. Anyway, I, yeah, I didn't want to spend, obviously, the whole time on, on that kind of stuff. But uh, but no, that's good. That's good for people to uh, to hear, and then our listeners will look into it on their own, and you know, we'll just see what, see what shakes loose. And then I'm going to apologize because we'll probably go all over the place because that's just – just uh that's what we do <laughs> but uh so and i know you know it'd be awesome if we could do everything in chronological order but it's probably just not realistic this case has a ton of information and if i just was trying to focus on one thing you end up coming up with about five different things it seems like so i do apologize in advance if we uh get out of order here clint do you have any information on uh this red truck that is uh it just kind of gets uh, revisited every every few months or so, um, this red truck that was in the area. Um, you know anything about that? Yeah. Yes, I do. I've, I've heard uh, the witness uh, that, that spotted this red truck. I've got some of her stuff that she said uh, in front of me here. And that's Welma and Robinson? Welma Robinson, also known as Robinson Ordway. Uh, she was a local resident, very close to where the accident took place with Mara. Uh, thing of it is, I'll, I'll just say this in advance is this is not something that I've all, I've really ever associated with Morrow, but then I, you know, as I look at it closer, maybe we should look at this a little bit harder because the timeline is, is probably a little closer to when Mara had her accident than I thought it was. So anyway, let's talk about the red truck. So this, uh, this, this person is walking from her residence to the Swiftwater store. And I'm sure you guys have heard of that store yep. by now. Yep. Uh, she thinks it's around 7 o'clock that she's walking to the store that same Monday night that Mara went missing. Uh, as she was walking up a hill, uh, a truck passed her and, and slowed down. And when it got uh, to the middle of the hill, it stopped in the road. And she immediately noticed the license plates of this truck, and it was Massachusetts, uh, according to her. Of course, it is dark out, and there was only one street light, and she points that out, but uh, so anyway, so she sees this truck. It's kind of almost like it's looking. F it's it's spotted her and it's trying to see if it knows her. That's kind of how she uh, described it. She was, she does say she wasn't afraid. She didn't feel like she was in any danger. She just felt like it was maybe somebody trying to see if they knew her. So as she got closer to the truck, though, the truck ended up taking off. Or you know, not and I don't mean that in a nefarious way. It just means that it ended up leaving before she even got up to it. So, so she uh, kind of it goes out of her mind, and she's uh, walking to the store. When she gets towards the parking lot of the Swiftwater store, she sees the truck again, and it's in the parking lot. And this is now a well-lit uh, parking lot, so she can, she can get a little bit better view. She could, thinks there's maybe even more than one person in the truck, is, if I believe, uh, believe right. But as she walks up, 
Let's see. Yeah, basically, so she walks up, and then the truck uh, departs from, from the gas station or from the Swiftwater store and heads east towards where the accident took place. So if, if her time, time frame is right and she was walking to the store at 7, and, and it sounds like that this car was probably about 10 minutes ahead of Mara when it left the parking lot of the store. So this, and then that was the last she saw of the truck. Uh, she said she was in the store for about 30 to 45 minutes, and it was about tw uh, th 20 or 30 minutes after she had been in the store that she heard uh, police go by, and that was probably the cop respondent. That was probably the first responding officer to get to the uh, site. When she walked back from the store to her house, uh, an, a an ambulance uh, that had responded to Mara's uh, wreck. Uh, actually was driving the other way now. It was leaving the scene of the accident, and it actually stopped when it saw her walking because it thought maybe uh, that could be the person, that, that could be the owner of the car. And so when the uh, ambulance or when the rescue uh, vehicle approached her, uh, they actually knew her, so then they realized that it wasn't the, the person in the, in the uh, it wasn't Mara. Does the witness, Robin, did you mention anything more specific about the truck? Was there any writing on it or anything like that? Or? Uh, she s believes it was a uh, uh, four-wheel drive truck, three four-ton pickup because it sat up high. The other thing she remembers about it is the window in the back was hard to see in. It wasn't very large. She I think she described an eagle on the back window. Uh, she thinks it might have been an older truck, but I think the biggest point she made about the truck was that she believes it was used for hauling wood. She said she's thinking it had uh, like wood slats on the uh, uh, in the bed of the truck. So I, you know, I don't. So it's really hard to say. I know she did try uh, to go online and find that truck. She couldn't find the truck again. Never saw the truck again in the area, but she did try to uh, go online and try to find a, a close resemblance to that truck and i don't know if she ever was successful in that when did she give this statement well right now i'm actually quoting her when she got on a message board so uh i don't i think it was like three days maybe after the uh accident she lived in the area was going for a yes. walk going to the store she was getting some items at the store and she actually spent 30 to 45 minutes in the store, and I think she did make a comment to the uh, workers in the store about the truck, asking them if, if that the uh, pers people in the truck came in the store or not, and they said that no, the people never came in the store. So whoever was in that truck had just pulled into the parking lot and was kind of sitting there for a, a little bit, and then when she got closer to them, I, that's when they left. So orient me a little bit with um, the direction the truck was going. Is that the same direction that Morris' car would have been going, or would that be? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it was going huh. east. And this store, and I don't, you guys, have, I'm sure, have driven past it. It's not far at all from from the accident location. No, it was, no, it isn't. And it's it actually really small. I kind of wonder what she was doing in there for 35 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I, she she knows the uh, store owner, so it could have oh, just okay. been talking to you know who knows, but. But yeah, that's what she says. She was in there for 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, so from the accident site, it's probably, what, a quarter of a mile? Yeah, exactly. And and that was always something, you know, for thinking about, well, you know, if Mara was just wanting to, to find safety that night and she didn't trust the school bus driver, that was a very good place she could have could have went to. You know, it was right, she had just passed it before she wrecked, so she could have went to the store and gotten help, you know, if that was what it was about for her. But, you know, and obviously... You know, if she had been drinking, uh, she might want to get away from the scene, too. Just to clarify, the red truck left the Swiftwater stage shop before Mora's car went by. Right. And I'm, I'm estimating about 10 minutes before Mara got to the area. So uh, here was a quote uh, about, about Miss Ordway or Miss uh, Robinson approaching the, the stage shop. Uh, she says, as I approached the stage shop, the truck was in the stage shop parking lot. I could tell there was someone watching me, and as I got in the light of the pumps, the red truck pulled away, again towards the accident. When I went in the store, I asked Winnie if some people came in the store just now, and she said no. And I said, well, there was a red truck that stopped in the hill with Massachusetts plates and then took off and was in your parking lot as I approached. We both shrugged it off as someone looking for someone else. 
that's really creepy behavior. Yeah. Enough yeah. for, you know, and enough of suspicious behavior for her to note all those details. Her radar went off. Her radar went off, but again, she did go on to, to make it clear that she never at any time felt threatened by the person. So, In retrospect, you look at it and it's like so creepy in my head because, you know, I'm just like piecing things together. But, you know, if I'm walking along and I see a truck, yeah, I don't really think twice about it. If it's looking for somebody, you know, like it just wouldn't, you know, it's, it's probably not as big of a deal in her head. But, yeah, looking back on it. You know, especially the line where she says that I could tell that somebody was watching me. And she noted what state the license plate was from. She noted there was an eagle on the back windshield, which actually, uh, not to not to get too many people pissed off, but um, Psychic Lori Bruno mentioned an eagle. Oh, really? She did. I didn't even, I didn't hear that part. But... Yeah, but it wasn't on, it was, I think, I believe she said it was on someone's jacket, potentially. I always thought it was about 20 minutes that this truck uh, left ahead of Mara. So that, you know, to me, that would be way too far. If you're drowning, if that truck was in tandem with her to be 20 minutes ahead of her, you know, as you're entering the White Mountains forest, seems like a little excessive, you know, because who knows what could happen. You want to make sure that you're, you're staying in view of that person. There's a lot of confusion about the weather that night of the accident, and there's good reason for it because there's different reports out of what the actual weather was. But I can 100% say for sure it was right around 32 degrees uh, where Mara went missing at that time, 7 p.m. that night. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on that because even Fred, I think, in, in uh, when he was like writing those letters and, and that kind of thing, he describes the night as being 12 degrees and, and freezing. Other reports do the same thing, describe it as being very cold that night and all that. But in actuality, the day before, February 8th, it was freezing. It was like in negative 7 was like the uh, temp- the temperature on February 8th in that area that Mara went missing. February 9th, it had climbed all the way up to 30 two degrees so that's a huge jump for one day so you had a warming trend going on at the time that mara went missing right and all bodies of water would have been frozen over at that point and a common mistake is a lot of people you can go online and they have they have sites where you can type in a date and you can get the weather and a lot of mistake people make including myself is when i went to try to track down the weather i type in what are you going to type in you're going to type in february 9th 2004 because that's the day that mara went missing so you want to find out the highs and lows of that day but you got to keep in mind mara went missing at the very tail end of february 9th so it's uh, the weather you need is for february 10th that's going to be the closest weather uh data that you're going to get uh so at february 9th if you type that in, it's going to say like negative degrees outside because probably at midnight at February 9th, early Monday morning, it was probably that cold. Yeah, right. Yeah, Very exactly. So, yeah. so on Tuesday, fe- uh, February 10th is what you need to type in if you're doing a uh, search for the weather. And you'll see that it, the, the lowest it even got at that point was like 30, 32 degrees. So. some conflict on whether or not who reported the rag in the tailpipe did fred get to the area and go to police and say hey there's a rag in the tailpipe but it's it means nothing you know i found i told mara to put it in there uh, to hide you know smoke or whatever was this something that fred initiated or not actually i can now 100 percent say that no fred murray did not bring this rag up to police at all this was something that was in the 911 logs actually uh, before fred murray had ever even been been contacted about his daughter going missing they talked about the they're finding a rag in the tailpipe not only that but when fred fred and family got to the area and they did a briefing with the family on 
on the and on all the the accident location they talked about the rag in the tailpipe and they specifically told the family not to talk about that with anyone so this was supposed to be something that did not come out publicly and what ended up happening was the family was going to honor that as it sounds like and uh so the rag was not going to be mentioned at all. Uh, they ran a website, the, the Murray family did, that had a forum at one time. Somebody that night that had been briefed about the rag and the tailpipe went on that forum and mentioned the rag. And at that point, the family consulted their, in, their own investigators and said, hey, you know, we need to, con- we need to uh, you know, talk about this rag and the tailpipe since somebody brought it up. And at that time, they, their own investigators gave them permission to go ahead and talk about the rag and the tailpipe. Well, I mean, what it has done is clear up everything that's been put out there about Fred volunteering that information that he, you know, if you find a rag in the tailpipe, I, I told her to put it there. Put it there. I mean, I've been telling people that for a long time because that's just what was out there. So, you know, once again, you, this has, like, blown my mind. So thanks, Clint, for blowing my mind. Anything I can do to help, guy. So why would the police want them to keep that secret? Uh, uh, your guess is as good as mine on that. I, You know, I really don't know the answer to that. I, well, know, it's not like... It was evidence. Uh, for whatever reason, the, the police used it as evidence. They took the entire tailpipe off of the car. Uh, muffler muffler included so that was presumably brought into evidence and that's the only reason i can think that they wouldn't want anyone to talk about it publicly oh right absolutely because they're not going to want to give a detail out that they look at and say oh this is something that potentially could be um anyone who committed a crime here would know about you know so they're not going to put that on the public they want to find out if someone's going to talk about that yeah i haven't even thought i haven't even really thought about that I can't believe we haven't mentioned it yet, but there was a book found in Maura's car um, when she went missing. And Clint, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? It was called Not Without Peril, 150 Years of Misadventure on the Presidential Range of New Hampshire. Uh, author was Nicholas S. Howe. Obviously, it's about the uh, White Mountains, uh, and Mara was an avid hiker. Uh, I'm very confident in saying that this was and her White Mountains were her favorite place in the world. She was actually planning her honeymoon in the White Mountains. Uh, so this is uh, this is something. This book is probably very near and dear to her. I would imagine. Uh, the important thing to note about this book: what's this book really about? Obviously, there's a lot of deaths mentioned in this book. Is this a death book? Uh, is this a how to kill yourself book? You know, I don't think so. It's it's. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of, you could probably get a lot of different interpretations of the book. Uh, personally, I have not read this book. I think that's important. I should mention that. What I have done is I decided a long time ago when I was investigating this is to, for me, somebody that's never hiked a day in my life to read a book about hiking is probably not going to do anybody any good. You know, as far as me trying to, to gain information and, and try to get in this tomorrow's head a little bit. Me reading a book like that is probably not going to do anything for anybody. So what I did was I went and, and I actually uh, have listened to a lot of hikers, uh, actually read a lot of reviews from, from avid hikers about this book. I wanted to hear what they thought about this book because that would be the closest thing I think we could do to get into somebody like Mara's head who was also an avid hiker. And basically this book is, it's a lot about, you know, some very courageous people that were put into life and death situations. Uh, Maybe they were ill prepared for their hike and they ended up having to try to find ways to survive. And there's a lot of creativity that was involved with these people trying to survive. There's a lot of uh, just story about, you know, there is some uh, tragic element, obviously, to a lot of these stories as well. Uh, to me, it almost uh, almost rom- romanticizes, if I could even use that word, in in the context of death. Uh, you know, the just how how beautiful and how dangerous at the same time the White Mountains are is kind of what the book is all about. Yeah, yeah, and this this book was uh, one of the one of the few things that was found in Morris Carr, correct? Correct, and she had a uh, she used a, a baseball card of her 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 brother 
Uh, if you're familiar with, if you have kids uh, and you're they're into sports, they might have had some time had a photo taken where they're kind of put on a baseball card, make some, you know, it's a pretty cool little thing that, that, that's done all across America, I'm sure. You have these baseball cards where you're on it. And she had a baseball card of, of her brother that she had bookmarked to a, a specific chapter. I just got extremely sad right there. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the actual chapter was the second to last chapter in the book. It's called A Question of Life or Death, and it's a story of McDonald Barr. And he's, an, he's a fellow Massachusetts guy. He, uh, is a, he's a, he was 52 at the time he died. He was just about to get his Ph.D. in geography from Boston University. So this is a guy who's extremely experienced with outdoors, with hiking. He's very experienced with the White Mountains. And yet he met his uh, fate uh, uh, one day in the White Mountains. And the, the story, I have read that story. I've read that full chapter. I've got all kinds of notes on that chapter. Uh, and we definitely will talk about that uh, the next time. And, and this is a, this is a, a chapter. I, I think this has a little bit of everything in this chapter. I think this could be a guy that Mara kind of looks up to. I think it could be, you know, if you want to look at it from a cautionary tale, there's obviously some things that he did that uh, let kind of helped create the situation that he ended up in. You know, he was kind of faced with the obstacle of, uh, do I continue hiking even though I know I'm probably going to die? And he actually ended up uh, continuing on hiking and, and ended up dying. So uh, that's why it's kind of, that's part of the reason that chapter is called A Question of Life or Death. Yeah, and I think a little bit of homework on our end, and maybe um, maybe for the listeners as well. I'm definitely reading that chapter, if not the whole book, the next time we talk. But I also want to like think about whether or not that was a message to a brother. Pretty great interview from Clint. A lot of good information in there. Yep, absolutely. Every single time he comes on, he like he does something, he says something that uh, that I, I had always thought one thing, and uh, and Clint turns it on its head. Just shows his level of dedication. He's a good guy. He is. And so next week, we want to do a comments episode and respond to some of the emails and tweets that we've been getting. There's some interesting stuff that have been filtering in. And also, we just want to pretty much go over all the things we've learned in the past um, four episodes. We had a, an interview with James Renner, one here with Clint. We had Dr. Robert Eckstein on, and we also had the psychics on. So we sort of want to just recap all, uh, all those episodes. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a good idea to reset, um, every so often and just kind of go over what you learned and, uh, and, you know, kind of remind yourself what's, what's out there because we do have some emails and some messages that come through asking us about certain things, uh, you know, like the, uh, not without peril book. Uh, that's something that we're going to get into probably with Clint later on, but, um, yeah, so it's, it's good to reset and read these emails and just kind of remind ourselves where we are right now, where the listeners are and, and, you know, what we're doing moving forward. We do have some exciting upcoming episodes planned. We are planning a hike. I don't want to say any more about that. And we do plan on having the Generation Y podcast guys on the show. And I really also want to have on the Thinking Sideways people to discuss their take on the Maura Murray case because both of those podcasts covered her disappearance in an episode. I think especially with this case, I mean, it's a great idea. We do a crossover to other podcasts with similar themes so they have similar audiences and all that is is more eyes on this case so uh yeah i think that's uh, i think that's an amazing idea i can't wait to talk to these people sounds good well thank you everyone for listening please send us some emails missing murray at gmail.com we do plan on doing a paranormal episode to air around halloween so if you have any paranormal thoughts um explanations on what may have happened to mora please send them to missingmoramurray at gmail.com. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. Please follow us on Twitter at Doc, And very special thank you to Clint Harding for joining us on the show again. We'll be back next week. Keep everything, uh, keep all the communication going and uh, stay tuned. Thanks a lot.